Welcome to the next lecture on the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. Uh, this lecture is going to focus on the basics of Ethereum. So we're going to dive into wallets, how to create transactions, and also how to run a basic smart contract. Um, here's just a license and disclaimer. This is a create, create under Creative Commons. Uh, we're also leveraging some materials from the Mastering Ethereum GitHub site by Andreas Antonopoulos and Gavin Wood. And I'd like to thank Andreas, Gavin, and the other GitHub contributors for making their content available under this Creative Commons license. Uh, these materials are not investment advice or legal advice. Mentions a particular blockchain project should not be construed as an endorsement. So here's our agenda. We're going to take a look at the different uh, currency units for Ethereum. We'll dive into wallets. We'll create a wallet in MetaMask. We'll create a simple smart contract. And then we'll compile, deploy, and test set smart contract. So Ethereum's uh, currency unit is not actually called Ethereum. Instead, it's called Ether. Um, and it's typically abbreviated ETH. Um, Ether can be subdivided into smaller units, and I'll show you a table on those smaller units. Uh, the tiniest uh, unit is a weight. Um, so one Ether is 10 to the 18 way. Uh, so here's a look at different unit names. Um, we've got Ether which is 10 to the 18 way, as I mentioned. Um, we've got a Babbage, which is 10 to the cube way, Lovelace, 10 to the six way, Shannon, 10 to the nine way, Cezabspo, 10 to the 12 way, and Finney, 10 to the 15 way. Um, and then uh, if you have a thousand ether, you've got a grand, which is also known as a kilo ether. And if you get 10 to 24, uh, that would be a mega ether. All right, so let's talk about a few of those names. You may have recognized uh, the smaller names uh, actually are named in honor of various uh, computer scientists. Um, Helfini was pretty big in Bitcoin. Sazasbo came up with the idea of smart contracts. And uh, Babbage is perhaps our most famous computer scientist, uh, along with Lovelace. And Shannon's, uh, you know, a relatively famous cryptographer. So it gives you an idea of who some of those people are. So let's talk about wallets. Uh, the term wallet can mean a number of different things, but basically from the context of this lecture, the wallet means a software al application that helps you manage your Ethereum account. Uh, so an Ethereum wallet is your gateway to the Ethereum system. Uh, it holds your private keys and your public keys. It can create and broadcast transactions on your behalf. Uh, choosing an Ethereum wallet can be difficult because there's uh, different options and different features and designs. Um, so, you know, not everyone's going to choose the same wallet because different people are going to have different wallets just because they uh, require different capabilities. Um, now, that being said, the Ethereum platform is going through dramatic change, and the wallets are also going through dramatic change. So um, I'm going to show you a couple of different wallets uh, during this lecture and in other lectures. The primary one we're going to be showing is probably going to be MetaMask, just because it's a pretty basic one. Uh, but that doesn't mean that's the wallet I recommend that you use uh, in real life. Um, that just means that this is the one I've chosen to use for demonstration purposes. So here are some of the wallets that are out there. Uh, MetaMask is a browser extension wallet that runs in your browser. Uh, you can run in Chrome, Firefox, Brave, and so on. Um, it's pretty easy to use, convenient for testing. It can connect to a variety of Ethereum nodes and test blockchains. It's a web-based wallet that includes mobile apps for iOS, iOS and Android. Uh, it's actually uh, being worked on uh, significantly by the team at Consensus. Um, JAX is a multi-platform and multi-currency wallet. Runs on a variety of operating systems, including Android, iOS, Windows, Mac OS, Linux. Uh, My Ether wallet is a web-based wallet that can run in a lot of different browsers. It can also run on Android and iOS. 
Um, it's got a lot of uh, features. Uh, Emerald Wallet is designed to work with the Ethereum Classic blockchain, but it's compatible with other Ethereum blockchains. It's an open source desktop application and works under Windows, Mac OS, Linux, and so on. Uh, Emerald Wallet can run a full node or connect to a public remote node, work in a light mode. It also has a companion tool to do operations uh, from the command line. So there's, there's a, a number of different wallets out there. This is just a, a, a small subset of the many different wallets. Um, you know, there's things like Ledger, Trezor, and so on. So let's talk about control and responsibility. Um, open blockchains like Ethereum are important because they operate as a decentralized system. Um, that has a number of implications, one of which is that each user of Ethereum can and should control their own private keys, which are their, the which allow them to control access to their funds and smart contracts. So you can think of this combination of access to funds in smart contracts as an account or a wallet. Uh, these terms can vary a little bit in the details, so we'll talk about the details later. But as a fundamental principle, um, you can think of as a private key controlling an account. Um, you know, some users let third parties manage their uh, private keys uh, as a custodian service, such as an online exchange. Um, but we'll be talking about um, you know, some of the uh, advantages of managing your own keys. However, managing your own keys gives you and having control of your funds is a responsibility. If you lose your private keys, you lose access to your funds and smart contracts. Uh, once you lose the private keys, um, no one can help you regain those private keys. And so your funds are locked forever. So there are a few tips to consider when you are uh, securing funds. The first and most important tip is don't create your own security approach. Don't use improvisation. Instead, use best practices, the tried and tested standard approaches that the industry has arrived at. Um, the more important the account, i.e. the more funds in that account or the more significant the smart contracts accessible, the more security measures you should take. Um, if it's really important, put a lot of protection around it. Uh, the highest security is gained from an air gap device, um, you know, i.e. a device that's not connected to the internet, but that level is not required for every account. Um, you never want to store your private key in plain format, especially on a computer. Uh, fortunately, most user interfaces today won't even let you see the raw private key. Uh, private keys can be stored in encrypted form uh, as a digital key store file. Being encrypted, they need a password unlock. When you're prompted to choose a password, make it strong, i.e. a long and random password, um, back up, back it up and don't share it. If you don't have a password manager, write it down and store it in a safe and secret place. To access your account, then um, you need both the key store value file and the password. Um, don't store any passwords in digital documents, digital photos, screenshots, online drives, encrypted PDFs, and, set, and so on. Don't improvise security. Use a password manager or pen and paper. When you're prompted to back up, you know, when you initially install a wallet, you're going to be prompted to back up a key as a monomic word sequence. Um, use pen and paper to make a physical backup. Don't leave that task for later. You're going to forget. Uh, these backups can be used to rebuild your private key in case you lose all the data still saved in your system or if you forget or lose your password. However, they can also be used by attackers to get your private keys. Um, so never store the monomic word sequence digitally and keep the physical copy stored securely in a locked drawer safe. Yeah, as you'll see in another lecture, this monomic word sequence is essentially your private key, just kind of uh, written as, in the format of words as opposed to being a, a long random number. Uh, before transferring any large amounts, First, do a small test transaction of less than a dollar in value and wait to see if the transaction went through. Um, when you create a new account, start by sending only a small test transaction to the new address. Once you receive the test transaction, try sending back again from that account. There are lots of reasons account creation can fail. So, and if it has gone wrong, you want to find out with small loss. If the test works, all is well. Um, public block explorers are basically search engines for the blockchain, and they're an easy way to independently see whether a transaction has been accepted by the network. However, it has a negative impact on your privacy 
because if you are searching on a search engine, um, then that block explorer now knows what you're interested in, just like Google knows what you're interested in when you search on a search engine like Google. Um, there will be some examples in this uh, lecture. You obviously, don't send any cryptocurrency to the examples in the lecture. All right, so let's take a look at uh, the first uh, wallet we're going to play around with, which is MetaMask. Um, now, one thing, and so for example, I'm going to show you an example of installing it in Chrome. Now, there are other browsers that it supports, but for this particular example, we just pick Chrome. That does not recommend, we're not actually endorsing Chrome here, though. Um, so the first thing to keep in mind is when you're going and you're downloading uh, one of these browser extensions, um, you want to make sure you're downloading the real MetaMask extension. Sometimes hackers will sneak a malicious version of MetaMask in. So the real one will show an ID. It'll show that, hey, it's coming from MetaMask IO. <coughs> It'll show that it has over 9 million users and over 2,000 reviews. So once MetaMask is installed, you should see a new icon like this uh, fox head in your browser's toolbox. I'm oh, sorry, in the toolbar. You click on it to get started. You're going to be asked to accept the terms and conditions and then to create your new Ethereum wallet by entering a password. So, so over here, you can see where you'd enter in a password and confirm it. Um, once you've set a password, MetaMask will generate a wallet for you. And then it will show you a monomic backup consisting of 12 English keywords. Uh, these words can be used in any compatible wallet to recover access to your funds should something happen to MetaMask on your computer. Uh, you don't need the password for this recovery. The 12 words are sufficient. So these 12 words, piano, tower, spell, inhale, drama, inside, else, quarter, quality, velvet, small fit, are actually your private key written in a human readable format. Um, and we'll show that you know, later when we dive into the details how key, keys work. But basically, that's your private key. And so you don't want to put those 12 words on the internet somewhere because then a hacker will find them and they'll be able to take your funds. Uh, because anyone who has access to those 12 words can generate a wallet and access your currency. All right, once you've confirmed you've stored your uh, backup uh, securely, you'll be able to see the details of your Ethereum account. And so here, for example, we've got our newly created Ethereum account, and currently we've got zero Ethereum in it, and we haven't done any transactions. But the account will show the name of your account, in this case, 0 x 90 7, 3, and so on, and a little icon to identify the account. At the top of the account page, you can see which Ethereum network you're currently working on, the main network. So congratulations, you've set up your first Ethereum wallet. So as you saw on the MetaMask account page, you can choose between multiple Ethereum networks. By default, MetaMask will try to connect to the main network, you know, the Ethereum mainnet. Um, but the other choices are public test nets, places where, uh, or other Ethereum nodes, your choice, or even nodes running private blockchain, blockchains on your own computer. In later lectures, I'll show some examples of connecting uh, um, MetaMask to uh, an application we're running on our local computer. Uh, but for now, um, just keep in mind that there are multiple Ethereum networks that you can create or that already exist out there. The main net is the one with real currency, but there's many other networks. Um, so there's a the main Ethereum uh, network, there's the Ropstein, Coven, Wrinkleby test nets, and you get your local networks. Um, your MetaMask wallet is going to use the same private key and Ethereum address on all the networks it connects to. However, your Ethereum address balance on each Ethereum network will be different. For example, your keys may control Ether and smart contracts and Robston because you've deployed stuff there. But if you haven't deployed anything on the main network, you won't have any balance on the main network. So think of the MetaMask wallet as really just a, a graphic user interface that shows you what your private key controls. 
Um, and so your private key is a random secret number that only you know, and you can use that same random secret number in other places. Um, so here, here's a look at some of these different networks. There's the main Ethereum network, which has real currency on it. Um, and if you lose your currency, there's real consequences to it. Uh, there's a Robston test network. Uh, there's a Coven test network. Again, neither of these have any value. Um, there's the Wrinklebee test network, yet another test network. Um, you can test on local hosts. You can create your own uh, connections using a custom RPC call and so on. Um, all right, so let's talk. I mentioned these test networks. How do we get some test ether? You know, you know, if we're going to do some tests playing around with Ethereum network and we don't want to spend real money, how do we do that? Well, what we can do is we can, instead of spending real money to get real ether, we can go to one of these test networks. We'll actually give you Ethereum for free. So we can uh, have MetaMask connect to the Robston test network, and there will be an option to click on deposit and click on the Robston test faucet. So MetaMask will open a web page. It looks something like this web page here. Um, it'll ask MetaMask for a wallet address to send uh, test ether to. You can uh, request one ether on the faucet button and you'll see a transaction ID down at the bottom of the lower part of the page for requesting um, the ETH from that particular faucet. A faucet is basically an application designed to distribute currency. And so essentially what we're doing is we're sending in a request to that faucet. And then if, if they approve it, they'll send us some currency back. So hopefully our transaction will be mined by the, the Robston test network and your MetaMask wallet will now show a balance of one ETH on this particular blockchain. So we click on the transaction ID and your browser will take you to a block explorer, which will uh, allow you to visualize and explore blocks, addresses, and, and transactions. Uh, MetaMask uses the Etherscan block explorer. Um, there are several other block explorers as well. Um, the, the transaction containing from the uh, Robson test faucet uh, is shown here using Etherscan. Um, so we've got our transaction hash. Here's a hash for the transaction. So this hash for the transaction is basically an identifier for this unique transaction. Uh, it shows us the status, transaction succeeded. It shows us how many blocks there have been since the transaction went through. There's already been a few blocks. It shows us the timestamp, um, when it happened. Um, shows us uh, from who to who was the transaction and the amount. Uh, in this case, it was one ether. And because this is on a test network, the value of one ether is zero dollars. On the main network right now, you know, one ether is over four thousand dollars in value. So now um, that we received our test ether from the test uh, faucet, we can experiment by trying to send ether back to the faucet or to someone else for that matter. Um, so here's an example of sending that one ether back to, uh, to the faucet that gave us the ether. Um, so we click our uh, one ether button, tell MetaMask to create a transaction, paying the faucet back the uh, one ETH. Uh, MetaMask will prepare a transaction and pop up a window. Here's um, uh, now, MetaMask will say that we can't send one Ether back because we have an insufficient balance. Now, in Ethereum, similar to Bitcoin and other block, major blockchains, there's something called transaction costs, which is amount of money that you spend to make a transaction go through. Um, in Ethereum, we actually call these transaction costs gas. Um, and so we have to pay a certain amount of gas to send the Ether back. So because we're spending some of that ether to send it back, we actually have to reduce the amount of ether we're sending back. Um, you know, instead of sending one ether back, if we sent back like 0.99 or 0.98, that would give us enough left over to pay the transaction costs uh, in gas so that the remainder of the ether returns to the faucet. Uh, 
Um, and so um, usually gas, gas will be handed for you handled for you automatically. However, um, if you run out of Ethereum in an account, you will see an error message saying, hey, you can't process that transaction. Now this gets more complicated when we start diving into smart contracts. Because one of the things that we'll do with smart contracts is we're going to have to estimate how much gas are these contracts going to call, charge to run? Because keep in mind, why, why is the Ethereum network charging gas for these transactions? Well, the reason is because there are literally thousands of nodes out there that are going to process your transactions, your smart contracts, and so on. And it takes a lot of work to have thousands of computers processing this stuff. And so if you send in something really complicated that requires more work than normal, we want to charge more gas than normal uh, for your workload. And so gas is an important topic that we're going to talk about uh, later on in the course when we dive into the details of smart contracts. So you can, uh, once you get the, the, the transaction to go through, you can uh, click on view account on Etherscan to show your account's transaction history in the test network. Um, and really, these block explorers are very, very useful. They can show you a lot of information about what's going on. They can let you look at the details of the transactions. They can let you look at the details of the blocks that the transactions are in. Um, they can let you trace how, where the Ethereum came from and where it's gone. Um, so the block explorers are pretty useful. Um, and I highly recommend taking a look at them. Um, and it's nice that uh, MetaMask has this, you know, integration where you just click on a button and you're taken immediately to the Explorer. So here, for example, is looking at the, the transaction history and Etherscan for that particular account. In this pay, case, we sent 0.999 after we uh, paid the appropriate amount of gas, so we couldn't send the, the full out, the full Ether. Um, and you can see a list of what's going on with your account history. All right, let's talk a little bit, uh, now that we've taken a look at wallets, let's talk about um, Ethereum in the big picture. So far, we've been talking about Ethereum, ETH, uh, Ether as a cryptocurrency, but Ethereum is much, much more than just a cryptocurrency uh, because Ethereum has this goal to be sort of this decentralized world computer uh, so that if Ether is really just being used to pay for executing these smart contracts, which are computer programs that run on this emulated computer called the Ethereum virtual machine. Um, you can think of the Ethereum virtual machine as a global singleton, meaning that it operates as, as if it was a global single instance computer running everywhere. But obviously it'll be thousands of different copies of it, all achieving the same results. Each node in the Ethereum network is going to run a local copy of the Ethereum virtual machine to validate the smart contract execution while the Ethereum blockchain records the changing state of the world computer as it processes transactions and smart contracts. So um, the type of account you created in the MetaMask wallet is called an externally owned account. Externally owned accounts are those that have a private key. Having the private key means control over access to funds or contracts. Uh, the other type of account is a smart contract account, which has smart contract code, which is a, essentially an externally, which an externally owned account can't have. Um, so these externally owned accounts are really human users having private keys and a smart contract account doesn't have private keys. Um, but it's basically controlling what happens through the logic of the smart contract code. So contracts and the externally owned accounts both have addresses and the contracts can also send and receive ether just like the uh, externally owned accounts. And, but when a transaction destination is going to a contract address, it causes that contract to run in the Ethereum virtual machine using the transaction, the transaction's data as its input. In addition to Ether, transactions can contain data indicating which specific function of the contract to run and what parameters to pass that function. So transactions can essentially call functions within contracts. 
Um, but because contract accounts don't have private keys, they can't initiate a transaction. Only the end, the externally owned accounts can initiate transactions, but con contracts can react to transactions by calling other contracts, resulting in a complex ex execution path where a user calls a contract and then a contract can call another contract, which can call another contract and so on. Um, one example of that is an end uh, externally owned account sending a um, request transaction to a multi-signature smart contract wallet to send some ETH onto another address. Um, another example would be a decentralized application where a contract A calls contract B in order to maintain some sort of shared state across users of contract A. So let's dive into um, a very simple smart contract. So Ethereum has multiple different high-level languages, which can be used to write a contract and produce uh, Ethereum virtual machine bytecode. Um, the most popular of the smart contracts uh, and the one we're going to spend most of our time on is uh, Solidity, which was created by Gavin Wood. Um, and it's the most widely used language in Ethereum. So for our first example, we're going to write a contract that controls a faucet uh, to, you know, give out uh, ETH. Uh, we already used a faucet to get to, uh, test Ether on the Ropsten network. Um, so a faucet's a relatively simple uh, a smart contract. It'll give out Ether to any address that requests some Ether. And then the smart contract's going to have to receive some Ether periodically so that it can continue to give out ETH. And we can implement a faucet as a wallet controlled by a human or by a web server. So here is a very simple smart contract. Um, and this is basically uh, about as simple as we can make it. It's also a somewhat uh, flawed contract and that's got a number of bad practices in it as well as some security flaws, which we'll talk about later on in the course when we dive in the lectures when we dive into security. But let's just take a look at what this contract does and how it works line by line. So our first line is a uh, comment. We just have a uh, you know, creative uh, pragma solidity 064. Actually, that's not a comment. That's identifying what version of solidity we're using. Then we've uh, our next line is a comment where we say our first contract is a faucet. So this double slash here uh, indicates a comment. Um, basically, for those of you who've used Java or C++ or C, it's following the same standard, uh, very similar syntax to those languages. So the actual um, line contract faucet is where our actual contract starts. So this line declares a contract similar to a class declaration in Java or C or other object-oriented programming languages. Contract definition includes all of the lines in between the opening curly Q brace and the closing curly Q brace. Um, so this curly brace here after faucet and this curly brace here after um, at the end of this file. So all of that is part of the smart contract. Um, then we've got a couple functions. We've got a receive uh, function, which has a cope open and shut curly key brace and really nothing inside of it. And we've got a withdraw function, which has an open curly brace and a closed curly brace and a few lines within it. So let's talk about this receive function. Uh, this receive external payable function is called if the transaction that triggered the contract didn't name any of the declared functions of the contract or didn't contain data. And this was a plain uh, Ether transfer. Contracts can have a, a receive function without a name and it's used to receive Ether. Uh, that's why it's defined as external and payable. Um, after that, we declare uh, the function withdraw. So if we take a look at withdraw, um, this function is named withdraw and it takes one unsigned integer. Um, uint is short for unsigned integer. Um, 
and it was and the uh, we're going to label that variable that's being passed in as withdrawal amount. Um, the function itself is also declared as public for its access modifier, uh, meaning they can be called by other smart contracts. Uh, the function definition follows between the curly braces. Um, the first part of the withdrawal function sets a limit on the withdrawal amount. Uh, we limit, uh, so basically this require statement says the withdrawal amount has to be less than one followed by all those zeros. Okay. Um, and then we say, oh, we say message dot sender dot transfer, and then this withdrawal amount. So we're going to send one, whatever the what withdrawal amount was, so long as it was less than that number, we're going to send that, we're going to transfer that to whoever message sender is. Now, in this particular case, our transfer function is going to be sending way. Remember way, there's 10 to the 18 way uh, to one ether. So that's why we have all those zeros there. We've got three, six, nine, 12, 15. It looks like 18 zeros. Um, might be 15 zeros, but it's something like that. Um, so that's how much ETH we can send out from this contract. Uh, actually, it looks like it might be 17. Uh, so it's 0.1 ether there. Um, so if the withdrawal function is called withdrawal greater than, you know, 17, uh, 10 to the 17 way, then obviously that require function will fail. Uh, and then we'll, we'll break out of the withdrawal and we'll have an exception. Um, but assuming it succeeded, then we go ahead and transfer this withdrawal amount, whatever it was that was passed in, to message sender. Now message sender is a special address that refers to whoever called this withdrawal function. So whoever called this withdrawal function in a transaction will get this amount sent to them directly. So they don't actually, uh, and so that's how that function works. And then we close our function withdrawal here, and then we close our contract faucet down there. So this is a very basic uh, Solidity smart contract. So once you've written that source code uh, file in um, Solidity, the next step is to, to compile the uh, contract, just like you might compile a Java program or a C++ program. So we need to use a Solidity compiler to convert the Solidity code into Ethereum virtual machine bytecode. Um, so it can be executed by the Ethereum virtual machine on the blockchain. And it's actually very similar to what's going on in Java. When you compile a Java source code file, you compile it into Java bytecode that can then be executed by a Java virtual machine, wherever your Java virtual machine is, whether it's on a web server or browser or on your desktop. Um, and so we're doing the, essentially the same thing with Solidity, except that this code that's compiled is then executed on the blockchain. Um, so the Solidity compiler is actually a standalone executable. It's available as part of various frameworks and built into integrated development environments. Um, the more One of the more popular IDEs and the one I'll be using for most of my lectures is one called Remix, which you can use inside your web browser. So you can use uh, your web browser to navigate to the Remix IDE at remixethereum.org. So when you first uh, load Remix, it'll start with a sample contract, some sample contracts. Um, and so you can identify which contract you want to use. Um, so you can create a new one. So it's got some sample buttons for creating new ones. And so here's an example of, you know, open a new file and copying in that faucet example code uh, with uh, into that file. Now that it's, it's uh, in there, then you can go ahead and click on compile. Uh, one comment I'll make on this is that my slides are a little bit older than the current version of Remix. And so you might see a different uh, view of some of these slides in Remix. I'll show you some examples of the modern version of Remix um, in a subsequent lecture. Uh, it's pretty similar. Uh, they've just reorganized it slightly. Um, 
So once you've loaded the faucet uh, solidity contract into the Remix IDE, the IDE will automatically compile the code. If all goes well, you'll see a, a box with the faucet in it appear under the compile tab, uh, showing that you've successfully compiled the faucet. Um, here's a look at what the actual bytecode would look like. You know, this looks a lot like assembly language programming, and that's essentially what bytecode is. It's assembly language. Um, so obviously, um, you know, no one wants to program in this. They'd much rather program in Solidity or Java or another language like that. Um, so once you've compiled your software into bytecode, now we need to deploy that contract on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, so in this particular example, I'm going to use the Robson test network to test the contract. Um, so registering the contract on the blockchain involves creating a special transaction whose destination is essentially an address that's registering a uh, contract on the network. Uh, and so it's basically telling the Ethereum blockchain you want to register a contract, and that's handled for you automatically by the integrated development environment, and then it'll allow you to send con transactions to your wallet and so on. So here's an example of doing that um, in Remix. You know, basically, uh, you can specify what environment you want to run in. In this particular case, they're going to run on Robston Injected Web 3. Um, you can actually specify what accounts you want to use. You can specify gas limits and values. We'll talk about those settings later. Uh, but the important thing is you identify the contract, and then you can go ahead and deploy it, or you can load it from a particular address. So in this case, we're trying to deploy it. Um, notice that this pink and blue, we'll talk about those later, but basically pink means it'll cost gas to deploy it. Pink, blue usually means um, it doesn't cost any gas. Um, so now that that contract's been deployed, uh, what happens over on the MetaMask side? So we're going to, uh, MetaMask is actually being contacted um, and it's, you know, Remix has uh, constructed our Tra creation transaction and MetaMask is asking us to approve it. Um, now, in this particular case, the contract creation transaction has no ether in it, but it's going to consume some gas. So MetaMask wants to know if you want to approve it. And then it'll take, um, you know, something like 30 seconds or so, maybe faster for the contract to be mined on a test network. If you, some of the test networks are much faster than others. Um, so it really kind of depends which one you're working with. And now our faucet contract is alive. It's got an address of its own that you can view in Remix. Um, and then we can give that contract out to other people to uh, try and obtain ETH from the contract. Um, so interacting with contracts, uh, Ethereum contracts are essentially programs that control money, which run inside a virtual machine called the Ethereum virtual machine. They're created by a special transaction that submits a bytecode to be recorded in the blockchain. Once they're created in the blockchain, they have this Ethereum address, just like a wallet does. Anytime someone sends a transaction to a contract address, it causes the contract to run in the Ethereum virtual machine with a transaction as its input. Transactions sent to contract addresses may have Ether or data or both. If they contain Ether, it's deposited in the contract balance. They contain data. The data can specify the name function of the contract and call it passing arguments to the function. Um, so you can view that contract uh, in a block explorer that can view the test network you're working with. Um, so for example, you can copy the address of the contract to the Ropston Etherscan IO and do a click to see what's going on uh, in the Block Explorer so much, so, so long. Uh, and so here we're looking at our contract address we deployed in Ropston and we can see the uh, uh, transaction hash where we actually created it. And then as other people interact with it, you would see those interactions as well. Now we created this faucet to hand cryptocurrency out, but right now it doesn't have any currency other than what was, uh, so we need to give it some currency so that we can then hand currency out from the faucet. Um, so what we can do is we can use MetaMask to send some ether to that contract. Um, so you can copy and paste that contract address into MetaMask, send ether to it exactly as you would any other ether address. Um, then if we reload our block explorer, we can then show 
that there's been another contract to that con another transaction of that contract and we should see the updated balance. So we go over here to, uh, and if we wanna withdraw some currency and send it to our MetaMask wallet, we can kind of do it in reverse. We can go over to Remix where we've got our withdrawal function for the contract and pass the withdrawal amount argument to it and say, hey, I wanna get half an ether or whatever it is you wanna pull out from that faucet. And that should get sent over to MetaMask. And you can see your balance in MetaMask being increased because you've received some currency from that particular contract. Um, so here's an example of creating a withdrawal transaction. In this case, they were withdrawing 0.1 ETH, which was our maximum for our require. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, we have to put quotes around it. Um, and then uh, we, uh, once, once we uh, do the transaction, MetaMask uh, will then be able to show us, hey, we've confirmed a withdrawal and we can see the transaction reflected in our uh, in our wallet, as well as on Etherscan, if you look at the, the block explorer. So here, for example, is Etherscan, seeing uh, the fact that now we've had a number of, uh, we had our original contract creation, but then we've had two transactions since then, one of them funding it and one of them doing a withdrawal. Now in this particular case, um, so we've got our, uh, transactions described sometimes you know it's a little hard to see exactly what's going on uh, for example here we're showing values of or what what's being sent in it doesn't actually show the withdrawal um, so again it, you have to look at the different arguments to see exactly what's going on um, here we see the actual value that's uh, being withdrawn the 0.1 ether um, so ethereum is really nice uh, programmable blockchain. And this was just a quick look at how it can work. We're gonna dive into everything I talked about in this lecture in much more detail over other uh, videos, diving into smart contracts, diving into how the ETH EVM works, diving into how MetaMask works, diving into how Remix works. Uh, but some of the basics are wallets hold your keys and can create and broadcast transactions on your behalf. Each user of Ethereum can and should control their own private keys, which are things that require control access to funds and smart contracts. Ether is meant to be used to pay for running these smart contracts, which are just computer programs that run on an emulated uh, network computer called the Ethereum virtual machine. And Ethereum contracts are these programs that control money, which run inside this EVM. All right, so I wanna thank everyone for watching this uh, introductory uh, lecture on Ethereum basics, part of the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett.